This is Halley's Comet. One of the first photographs of it taken from Britain this time round, and certainly one of the very first by a British amateur. It was taken a few nights ago by Ron Arbour from his observatory at South Wanston in Hampshire, which is where I am now. And uh, if the skies are clear, we're going to take another photograph of Halley's Comet later on tonight. Well, congratulations, Ron. Uh, I know at the moment Halley is difficult. What are the main problems you found in photographing it? Well, the first main problem is the fact that it's so very faint and extremely diffuse, and it makes it a very difficult object to photograph. Could you see it visually when you look through the telescope? No, it's much too faint for that, Patrick. I think it's around magnitude 15.5, which puts it beyond the limit of this scope. For so, visual so at the present moment, of course, you do need a pretty large telescope to photograph it. You do indeed. Later on, in December, with any luck at all, Halley should be visible with the naked eye, and then it'll be a great deal easier to photograph. And people are going to want to take their own photographs of Halley's Comet. What advice can you give them? Well, I would wait for the November the 16th, when it is one or two degrees below the Pleiades, and then use a telephoto lens, say around about a 200 mil, and try X or a fast color film. What kind of camera? Um, any sort of camera, 35 millimeter, two and a quarter square, anything. There's one obvious problem. As the sky goes round, so the stars go round with it, and so do the comet. And we all know that when you take a time exposure of the stars, what you get are star trails. How long exposure are you going to need for the comet when it's at its best? I would imagine about 10 seconds with a 200 mill millimeter lens. And the fastest film you can get? Definitely. There's one other point. Last time I came to your observatory, which was a few weeks ago now, the telescope wasn't here. When you've got a perfectly good observatory down at the bottom of the garden, why do you shift your telescope here against a wall? From here, Patrick, the comet is quite accessible. But from the observatory, it's completely obscured by a tree, so I had to move it from the observatory to here. It would be easier to move the telescope than move the tree, in fact. That's perfectly true. That must have been quite a problem. It was. First, I had to get permission from my wife to dig out the patio. <laughs> I don't wonder. Which took quite a bit of uh, persuading. And uh, when Halley has come and gone, then, of course, you'll presumably move the telescope back. I will, yes. Well, now let's come on to the telescope itself. It's a um, 16-inch reflector, and I gather you made it yourself. I made the optics, and a friend of mine built the computerized drive system. Well, come for the computerized drive later. Now, it's highly efficient. You've got a fairly massive finder, too. Yes, yeah, a six-inch guide scope, which is particularly useful for finding faint guide stars. What about the drive? Because if you're going to photograph a very faint thing, as Halley is at the present moment, then you've got to give a time exposure, and your drive's got to be pretty good. It has indeed, and this is quite an unusual system, which I'll show you now. Of course, a good telescope without a good drive is frankly completely useless for this kind of work. This is the actual drive gearbox, and it consists of a synchronous motor inside the drum, driven by a DC motor. And it's, as I say, a friction drive, and it's got no gear tooth errors, and, and it's that... extremely smooth. And How long can you trust the telescope to track for itself when you're taking a photograph without making any manual adjustments? Five minutes is guaranteed to within one or two arc seconds. Let's come on now to the actual optics, a 16-inch mirror, and I gather you did make that yourself. I did. I used a homemade grinding machine, grinding and polishing machine. I've never made a mirror larger than a 6-inch, and I don't think that was very good. I'd hate to tackle the 16 inches. this one is. Nor would I, Patrick, without a grinding and polishing machine. Well, this is a fairly typical grinding and polishing machine. You must admit it looks a bit Heath Robinson. That looks awfully like an old motor tower, for example. It's hardly surprising, because it is an old motor tower. <laughs> but I also know it's very accurate. Will you demonstrate exactly how it works? I will do. The machine was running then in the automatic mode, where you can leave it uh, polishing for an hour or so. Yes. And on the top is the polishing lap. What exactly is a polishing lap? A polishing lap is a lap made from pitch with grooves cut in it, and it's charged with Jewelers Rouge. Now, Jewelers Rouge is a very fine polishing agent that you need to um, attain the correct polish. The final figuring is done by hand, and I do that by taking, removing the polisher. Placing it back onto the mirror. Yes. And giving it some kind of hand stroking. I see. Of course, the mirror itself is pretty tough. Is it? Is it glass or is it Pyrex or what? It is Pyrex. It weighs about 60 pounds. How accurate does it have to be? About a tenth of a wave. And that's pretty small. That's a few millionths of an inch, in fact. 
Of course, I'm essentially a visual observer. You're an astronomical photographer, and that means using a special kind of camera, using this curious kind of black torpedo. Well, Patrick, this is a bottle of liquid carbon dioxide, which I make my dry ice and my cold emulsion camera. Why do you need it so cold? It's got to be cold because it's got to lower the temperature to minus 70, at which place um, it makes the film far more sensitive, about six times, in fact. And how do you go about it? Where, where does the torpedo come in? The torpedo comes in making the dry ice, which I'll demonstrate. It's made in this bag, and it's very cold. I hate to hold it, personally. I've been burnt by it several times. It could be quite tricky, I think. It can be quite tricky in the dark. And out comes the dry ice. Looks a mark like ordinary white powder, doesn't it? But I'd hate to touch it. It's a lot colder than white powder. And this is the camera. This is the complete camera. Nothing more to go on. No, that's the complete camera. Make that one yourself? Most, most of it, yes. Already loaded with film, I imagine. Yes. Here's the film. Perfectly ordinary film? Yes, 35 millimeter triax. Well, what is the result of cooling your camera down in that way? Well, two examples I have here demonstrate it particularly well. They're both five-minute exposures, but the top one is a five-minute exposure at ambient temperature. Yes. Whilst the bottom is five minutes in the cooled emulsion camera. And you can see there's quite a dramatic gain in sensitivity in the cooled shot. There is indeed. Do I recognise galaxies in the Virgo cluster? You do, yes. But you don't use your cold camera for all your astronomical photography, do you? No. No, it's mainly for colour pictures such as the Orion Nebula M42, probably the most photographed object by the amateur. It really does bring out the colours very well. I think another favourite is Messier 57, the ring nebula near Vega in Lava, a planetary nebula which is neither a planet nor a nebula. Yes, this comes out surprisingly red on amateur photographs. Let's turn now to something way outside our own galaxy, an independent galaxy, the very first spiral galaxy to be identified as such by the Earl of Ross way back in 1845. Messier 51 and the hunting dogs, the whirlpool. I think it earns its name, don't mm, you? It's a very splendid galaxy. It's very blue with a very tight, uh, bright nucleus. You know, I had a look at that visually the other night with my 15-inch reflector, and I could just about see the spiral form, well, not easily, but you recorded it very nicely there. Yes, it also shows numerous stars that can easily be uh, misidentified by the supernovae. And now for another favourite, Messier 13, the globular cluster in Hercules, on the edge of our own galaxy. Yes, a splendid object, and this print also shows the 12th magnitude galaxy to the northeast. I wonder what our night sky would be like if we lived in the centre of a globular cluster, the stars only light weeks away instead of light years. I'm sure astrophotography would be impossible under such conditions. I think it would. And, of course, the famous Andromeda spiral, Messier 31, the nearest of the really big spiral systems, just over two million light years away. Yes, of course, this held the very first visual sighting of a supernova, and it also, this photograph also contains several globular clusters. Isn't it a pity that M31 isn't face on to us in the way that the whirlpool is? It is, but we also get the marvellous dust lanes that we wouldn't see so well if it were. Perfectly true. Well, let's come back now to the solar system. Comets have been very much in the news, and we've had a periodical comet, Jacobini Zener, that's reached the eighth magnitude, and it was high up in the north in Cassiopeia, and this, I think, is a very nice picture of it. It's been a splendid object visually and photographically, and it is moving rather rapidly, so we have to compensate for this in photography. What time exposure was that? That was five minutes. Let's come on now, Ron, to the really serious scientific program we've undertaken. The search for supernovae in external galaxies. Tremendous stellar outbursts, reaching peak luminosities of at least 15 million times that of the sun. So obviously they can be seen over distances of many millions of light years. And uh, I know you are now engaged in a systematic hunt for them in other galaxies. That's correct. And the example we see here in this photograph of NGC 5595 is a 16th magnitude supernova and probably one of the brightest that we will see. Where exactly is the supernova? Just there. Is the supernova still there, or has it gone now? No, it's, it's since faded. You didn't actually discover that one, did you? No. Have you discovered any yet? Unfortunately, no. I've had some suspects, but nothing confirmed. Well, I'm sure that you will in the future, Ron, because this is the reason why you've so efficiently computerised your telescope. Let's have a look at some of your computerised mechanism, because without it, I think you'd be very hard put to it to maintain this search. So the first thing we have to do is to tell the telescope where it's pointing, because it's pretty stupid up until then, it doesn't know. And to do that, we, we must go into the automatic mode first. And if I can just... Well, let me get out of the way so you can just sit at the controls. Ah, 
and we tell the telescope where it is by fixing it onto a clock star of known right ascension and declination. Yes. And we then select the patrol program. That's going from one galaxy to another, in fact. That's correct. <coughs> and here we see the list of galaxies that are on the program for tonight. And, and they're above the horizon now. That's correct. It's, that's worked out by the computer. It slews automatically to the first object, finds it, takes a photograph of it, closes the shutter, and goes on to the next. What happens if, uh, during the exposure, the clouds come over? Well, we're working on a clear sky detector that would tell us that, so we'll have to close the telescope down when, it, uh, when it's cloudy. When this program is actually being carried out, I mean, it must take a large part of the night, do you actually stay with the telescope, or do you just let it go its own sweet way? It, it's, it's safer to stand by it. Is this the only computerized telescope engaged in this kind of work in the country, do you know? As far as I'm aware, it's the first amateur telescope on a supernova search. Well, the computer and the model work excellently. But now, Ron, can we go outside and see the real thing? Moving a model by a computer in this way is one thing, but this 16-inch telescope is very massive, and that's quite another story. It is indeed, but the principle is exactly the same, as I will demonstrate. The first thing we have to do is tell the telescope where it's pointing. Yes. So we set it on a bright star whose coordinates are already known. Once it's got to the bright star and we've centered that, we then punch in the coordinates of that star. Select the supernova search program. And from then on, the telescope will go and find the galaxies automatically on the list. Yes. Obviously, the telescope would not conduct a supernova <laughs> patrol here, not pointing at a wall in a tree. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be much good, would it? No. You've got to wait till you're back in your dome again. That's right. It's now exposing. And moving on to the next galaxy. And of course, the normal exposure time would be five minutes, and not just a few seconds as it is in this case. But the beauty of it is it's far more reliable than I am. It never misses a galaxy, whereas I can select the incorrect field. And each field has got to have two exposures, so we eliminate photographic flaws. How many galaxies can you cover in this way in one night's work? We, with this system, we can cover at least two dozen galaxies a night, whereas if we did it manually, we would be lucky if we could cover six. That is saying two exposures for each galaxy. So we increase it by quite a lot and our chances by quite a lot at the same time. When did you actually start this program? We, we set it about two years ago with an idea that we would eventually land up with this system. Have you begun your surveys yet? Just. I wonder how long it'll be before you discover your first supernova. Well, not too long, I hope. <laughs> so do I. And now the automatic search is completed. So, Ron, can we for the moment leave supernovae and come on to the real business of the moment, Halley's Comet? And can we now set up to take a genuine photograph of the comet? Yes, we can, but to do that, we replace our normal camera with a special cometry camera. And this camera tracks at the rate of the comet instead of sidereal motion. Because the comet's moving against the stars? Exactly. But first of all, we have to find the field of Halley. And to speed things up a bit, we'll slew it round manually. Now, Halley at the moment is only about 15 degrees above the horizon. We'll just get it so that it's in the field of the 7x50 finder. It's approximately there. We'll then remove the normal eyepiece and put it in a special comet camera. Which is placed at the position angle that Halley is travelling at the moment. The next thing to do is to find a bright guide star which can be about six to seventh magnitude and then replace the wide field eyepiece with a 500 power crosshair guiding eyepiece
and then we're ready to start the exposure and time it to the nearest second. Well, of course, this is um, a dummy run because obviously you can't photograph a comet or anything else when there are bright lights around. So if we're going to get a genuine picture of Halley's Comet, we've got to hope that these confounded clouds clear away and we've got to turn out all the lights. Now, of course, we're in the dark room. Ron, one thing intrigues me. You've got your telescope completely computerized, and yet, for photographing Halley's Comet, you set it by hand. I did indeed. That's just to demonstrate that we can still have it under complete manual control, and it's also a lot quicker to, to slew it round by hand. But you can, of course, use the computer for oh, it. Naturally, yes. Well, now, we've got the picture, uh, we hope. And the next thing to do is to prepare it. And now, is this a perfectly ordinary photographic process? This is a perfectly standard photographic process. It's the process that any amateur would have and would use, it, even down to the films and developers. It's all available from the local photographer's store. Um, I'll use the enlarger aperture at about f.56, sorry, 5.6, which reduces the grain shown on the print. And at the same time, I focus on stars that are nearer the edge of the plate to reduce the coma effect of the telescope. But apart from that, virtually everything is standard. There are a lot of fancy films available, but um, there's no real need for this. The normal Tri-X or HP5 that you can buy at the chemist is perfectly adequate. I realize this is a perfectly ordinary process, but for some kinds of astronomical photographs, there are various tricks you can do. There are indeed. Um, one of these is to make multiple negatives. You put one negative on top of the other, all taken at a similar time. Place it into the enlarger, and this get, reduces a lot of the grain, and it also gives you a much higher contrast print than you would normally get. It's a very useful dodge, actually. Well, now let's see whether we really have got a picture of the comet. There's the picture. And there is the comet. Look at it. Yes, it's a true. tiny smudge, but it's there, all right. It's and, and that is Halley's Comet. That is Halley's yeah. Comet. How long do you reckon you'll be able to go on following the comet? I reckon until about next July, something like that. On the observatory here? From here, yes. And in April, I, I plan to go to Australia to see it. You say, I realise that. What equipment are you going to take then? I'm going to take a small, medium format camera, because I think that will be the most useful to carry and uh, record a sizable comet. Well, Halley's Comet is certainly giving us plenty of excitement, and I really am excited to see it there on that picture we've just taken. But what about your own long-term plans, Ron? The first thing will be to move the telescope back into the observatory, and then my electronics expert, Tony Harrison, tells me that we are going to go into CCD. CCD being a charge couple device, a piece of electronic gadgetry. Yes, but a bit more sensitive than the photographic plates. In a few seconds, we will be able to do what we're doing now in, in minutes or half an hour or something like that. And which particular programs are you going to undertake? Um, carry on with the supernova search. This means that we'll be able to cover a lot more galaxies in an evening because being a sort of an 8 to 10 second exposure, we can ca ca cover numerous and store them on tape as well. So in point of fact, you have got plenty to occupy you astronomically in the next few years. Very much so. Ron, thank you very much. Congratulations on what you've done, and it's been great to come here. Thank you, Patrick. There's one point I think we must make. Here, Ron Arbour has a large telescope very efficiently computerized, and he's producing results of full professional standard. But please don't be discouraged, because as he's shown us, it's quite possible to take pictures of things such as Halley's Comet with an ordinary camera and develop them by ordinary photographic processes. So merely because you may not have elaborate equipment, don't feel you can't make observations, can't take photographs, and can't produce results of scientific value because you can. Although, of course, the more equipment you have, the better. So for the moment, from Ron and myself, from his observatory here in South Wanston, good night. The programme will be shown again on BBC Two at 6.25 next Saturday evening.